Welcome to the Veteran Spouse Network podcast, brought to you in collaboration with Coming Home Well. I'm your host, Hannah O'Brien, both a veteran spouse and the program manager for the Veteran Spouse Network. On each episode of our show, I will host different guests to learn more about the stories, unmet needs, and resources available to our military and veteran families. We're the show that's making space for your stories so that here you know you're never alone. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this month's episode of the Veteran Spouse Network podcast. When spouses join our peer support groups, one of the things they most often report wanting support around is how to support a partner with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, as well as how to care for themselves in the process. PTSD is obviously incredibly impactful for the individual experiencing it, but it also has a huge impact on relationships and on families. I myself am the spouse of a veteran with PTSD, and while my husband has done a lot of individual work and we've done a lot of work as a couple, it's still something we navigate regularly in our relationship. Knowing how much this impacts our community, we wanted to have PTSD in the relationship be the focus of this month's podcast. And with that in mind, I'm very excited to have Lauren join us today. Lauren is a veteran spouse and one of our peer leaders here at the Veteran Spouse Network. Lauren, we're so happy to have you here with us. I, and I'd love to turn it over to you to just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your family. Hi, Hannah, and thank you so much for having me today. I'm really looking forward to discussing this topic with you and sharing some of my experiences with our listeners. Uh, for a little bit about me, I'm currently finishing up my master's in social work from George Mason University, but before that, I worked in archival digitization and historic preservation after graduating with my master's of historic preservation from the University of Maryland in 2010. I currently work in two very different roles. One is in mental and behavioral health therapy, and then I'm also a digital content manager for a business that's located out of Austin, Texas. I met my husband in 2016, and we were married in 2021. We have two wonderful daughters, ages five and 12, and he was a Navy corpsman from 2004 to 2020 when he was medically retired due to combat-related post-traumatic stress. I provide caregiving and support to my husband, and part of my complete career change into the field of therapy was inspired by our life experiences related to his PTSD diagnosis. Very cool, and I feel that I was all set to go a different way with my career until I met my husband, so... And I know that's a lot of people in this field. As you know, a lot of our leaders are, of course, peers, but very passionate and oftentimes working in the space professionally as well. So we're excited to have you as a leader. And I, that's just so cool that you, you went into the, the mental health space as well for that reason. So of course you mentioned your husband has PTSD. That's why you're here talking about this topic. So tell me a little bit more about his experiences with that. Sure. So my husband uh, joined the Navy in 2004, just to give a little background on his military career. And he was a corpsman with a Marine infantry company that was in Iraq during 2005. And then in 2010, he managed a shock trauma platoon at Afghanistan. And just very quickly, a shock trauma platoon is basically a unit that stabilizes trauma patients before they're either sent to surgery or other facilities that have more robust capabilities. And on his last deployment, he was in Afghanistan for almost 11 months and was an Afghan advisor. So he worked with Afghan army soldiers to teach them an enhancement of their medical skills. So as a result of that, he dealt with a lot of trauma and uh, saw a lot of injuries during his deployment. So he was officially diagnosed with combat related post-traumatic stress in January of 2019 as part of a suicide intervention, and he was placed on limited duty uh, in March of 2019. And so we met for our background in 2016, and we became very close friends based upon the fact that at that time, we were both in very unhealthy and unhappy relationships. And so we had a common bond in talking about those things. And as friends, he shared experiences and traumatic events that he had not disclosed to anyone else because he had met with resistance when he had tried in his previous relationship. And I noticed that he seemed to struggle with depressive thoughts, 
uh, dislike of himself and frustrations over his military experiences. One of his primary concerns when he was initially diagnosed was that he was not going to be able to do his job any longer. And he had been in active duty for so many years at this point that he struggled with not being able to potentially deploy or to not be found fit for duty. And at that time, he felt that if his diagnosis were actually true, that that meant that he was weak. Mm -hmm. And I personally felt relief because it meant that he was going to get intervention and help and support that he needed. Yeah. And I've heard that story or that version of a version of that story many times before. So we hear it a lot with our active duty service members. I also think it's super cool that you're husband is a corpsman. My husband always speaks so highly of them. He calls them doc. So that's yeah. cool. Um, <laughs> I, I guess that's, that's just what it is. How they, mm-hmm. That's the term. So how do you, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is something a lot of our network are dealing with in their relationships, but maybe they don't always know that that's what they're dealing with. So I'm curious how how does your husband's PTSD show up? Like, what do you, what do you see how that impacts him? I think that for him, his PTSD impacts him in multiple ways. And what's tricky about it is that some of them are more subtle and then there are very overt uh, ways that you can tell that he has this diagnosis. So In a more overt way, physically, he is exhausted a lot of the time because he experiences sleep issues, specifically nightmares, and it makes it extremely difficult for him to rest. And when he tries to nap during the day, he often experiences where he loses track of where he is and he thinks he's back in Afghanistan, particularly uh, if the room is a warmer temperature, which in these winter months, I'm sure you have your heat on like we do. And that happens a lot. And so he has a lot of trouble with that and then becoming disoriented with where he is uh, upon waking. So he prefers that if he's going to nap that I'm present so that I'm able to orient him to his surroundings and where he is. Um, Again, in a more overt way, he's obviously more reactive emotionally. He tends to be in a heightened state a lot of the time, which is due to being caught in the chronic fight or flight mode. And more subtly, what I've noticed is that he is constantly thinking several steps ahead. So he assesses safety, potential threats, whether that's in a public setting or at home. So he can't really relax. And so an example of that would be that we just recently... um, experienced a flat tire and I thought okay we're just gonna call and get it fixed and it's no big deal and he spent over an hour calculating out the perfect way to get that taken care of he had to look at all the different potential avenues of if we do this what will this result in if this doesn't happen what's our plan b and a backup plan and so I think that for him sometimes that results in frustration because he feels the need to plan things out efficiently and well thought out and ensuring that he's taking care of any potential pitfalls or uh, threats, if you will, that may occur (laughs) to his plan. Um, And in addition, he also battles depression and uh, suicidal thoughts. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are shaking their heads right now as well, (laughs) sounding, you know, familiar. I think, you know, what's interesting or important, I guess I should say, uh, you know, if people don't know a ton about PTSD is that it's so individualized, right? It's different for everybody else. So there could be some shaking of the heads, but there also could be totally different experiences that if you're listening at home, you know, may be happening for you, but thanks for sharing that. And you mentioned, you know, that he found out while he was still active duty and had those concerns about how is this going to impact my job? Again, we've heard that many times before, and sometimes that can lead to like not seeking treatment. And so I'm curious what his treatment seeking journey may have looked like or not looked like. So it's definitely shifted from active duty to entering into this new veteran civilian world. Um, While he was on active duty, he was in treatment that was mandated by his Mm. command. Uh, Part of that was because of the suicidal intervention. As a result, he had to go 
to uh, traditional psychotherapy, and he was also seeing a psychiatrist, um, but was not actively placed on medications at that point uh, for anything. So from 2019 up until 2020, when he was medically retired, he participated in traditional psychotherapy. He also participated in art therapy and EMDR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, uh, which some listeners probably are familiar with. It's, it's one of the suggested treatments for uh, PTSD or trauma in general. And uh, post his getting out in 2020, he came to a place where he started to feel the treatment had really run its course, uh, so to speak, and that his focus was really shifting more into management of the symptoms as opposed to a reduction of his symptoms. And therapy, this may resonate with some people and their spouses, is that therapy was difficult for him in a lot of ways because it did focus on exploring the traumatic events, which did reopen wounds that had started to heal in some instances. And that created some re-traumatization for him uh, and kind of created a little further issues and so he really found the most success with the EMDR because that really let him focus on one particular event at a time. And so today, presently, he is not in traditional psychotherapy, but he does see a psychiatrist for, for medication management uh, for pharmaceutical treatment of the symptoms that he experiences, uh, particularly with the depression, mm -hmm. because he has been on medications for uh, his sleep and those were not unfortunately as successful. Yeah. Well, it sounds like he's had a very, a, a journey of sort. He's tried a lot of different mm -hmm. stuff. And so, and I'm sure that resonates with a lot of people too. And sometimes, you know, that's what you need to do to figure out what, what works, you know, or what does it. Yeah. Exposure therapy, not for everyone. Right. Um, and then for some people it's, it's the ticket and it really works and it does it. So it's good to hear that he tried some things and, and found what's working and, and medication's a whole other thing. I know my husband currently does not, he did that a lot of medication management when he first got out. And, you know, if you don't have a good, you know, provider who's really with you on that, that can be really challenging. I know they changed his meds like three times in one month. Um, and it was so disruptive to his life. He had to end up dropping out of college. Like, you know, he just like, wasn't so Yes. Good care is important, whatever that care is. Absolutely. And and that I know is another huge thing for a lot of the spouses, family members, caregivers in our community. Um, a lot of them are coming specifically wanting support around, you know, PTSD. But part of that, and then mm -hmm. even bigger than that, probably the second most or biggest support need we hear is how do I help support my partner to getting to treatment, you know, or they're resistant, you don't have you. So I'm curious what, in whatever that looks like for you, um, how that piece of it has been for you supporting him mm -hmm. in treatment or, or whatever supports he finds helpful. So I think initially when it was mandated, obviously there wasn't much support needed because he had to go. <laughs> You don't really have a choice at that point, as I'm sure many listeners are aware of. When your command tells you to do something, you do it. But post-service, I found that one of the keys really for me was to just provide encouragement whenever possible. And in a, a compassionate way, uh, telling him when I noticed that there were behaviors that were creating either disturbances, whether it was with himself for his sleep or among the family, because a, a huge thing is you can't force someone into therapy, right? Like you can't make them talk about things they're uncomfortable with. You can't lay down an ultimatum and say like, you are going to go to therapy or you're going to go to the support group, you know, or you need to find this type of help or things like that, because that just doesn't work. The person has to want help or they won't be receptive to it. So I found that providing compassion uh, was a huge key in that. So I encouraged him when he felt comfortable to discuss what some of his 
barriers to wanting to get treatment were. And that's where we ended up opening up the conversation about, well, for him, that he felt like he really had reduced the symptoms as much as they were going to be reduced. And it was more about how do I manage this at this point? Because um, he had reached a point where he was, was no longer drinking, which was incredibly helpful for treatment and for his healing process. And so for him, it was reminding him that he really owns this diagnosis and that it's his story to tell. And that when he is ready to open up and tell that story, that I'm always there to support that. And so I think that encouraging that and it, reminding them that particularly when they're post-service and when they're, you know, in the veteran and civilian world is that um, unlike in the military world, there isn't as much stigma with treatment um, because sometimes that carries over where, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, he felt like it was a weakness or that there was something wrong with him. There is kind of this avoidant nature that comes about with military culture. And it can be really difficult for someone who is veteran or even active duty to open up to someone and trust someone enough to open up to them. Um, and so I think another important way to encourage treatment is that you can also help by asking, you know, hey, do you mind if I help you find a provider? Or, you know, if we look together to find a provider or things like that, I think creating more of a union in working together for this diagnosis is really important as opposed to saying like, you need to do this or you should be taking care of this or you should be looking this up um, because it makes them feel even more alone. And so I think for creating support and encouragement is by, if you notice something, uh, mentioning it to them. Like if you notice that there's something uh, that is seemingly a little off or it's creating tensions or things like that. I think it, when you approach in a compassionate way, I think mentioning is important. And then I think also offering to do this as a team, as opposed to doing it in, or expecting them to seek the treatment on their own. And I do think that it's important is that the person has to want to receive the help. And so in my husband's case, he didn't want the help at first. And when he ended up actually deciding to go and receive help, receive treatment with the EMDR and things like that, which are things that he did do post his uh, separation. I think that finding that person on base who was able to be someone that he could open up to and talk about potential treatments was also a huge, uh, opening for him. So I think when you can find a fellow military member who can also offer perhaps some advice or <laughs> experiences with treatment, I think that's another way that can really, really help. So talking maybe to them about talking with their friends about this or things like that, I think are really important ways that you can actively support um, and show them that this is something that you are both in together. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that, that coming at it as a team. And I also picked up on, on something you said that I loved was that this is his story, you know, owning his mm -hmm. story, his experience. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, what does he want to do with that? And what does he want to do about it? And that really, those really, everything you said is really the best way to approach supporting your partner, but it doesn't mean it's, easy to do when right. you're there right as the spouse or the partner sitting there like <laughs> okay yeah but like I know you need help now and we're sh and, and we're mm -hmm. struggling now so I, I'm curious to hear from you we've talked about him a lot um <laughs> how how does this situation how does being with someone who does have this you know whatever mm -hmm. it is challenge that isn't going anywhere how does that impact you as their their partner yeah. Yeah. So it does sound really easy. I know to say that. And one of the ways it does impact me actually is uh, it makes me more cautious about how I initiate conversations with him because he does have a quick to anger reactivity. And he has, in addition to that, then a tendency to emotionally shut down once mm -hmm. he's 
been angered, uh, which can make it incredibly frustrating to try and hold conversations about important things. There are times that I need or want to have a conversation and it just can't happen at that moment, whether that's because he's shut down or because he's frustrated in that moment, or maybe I'm frustrated, to be honest, and that's not a great time to have a conversation either. And it leaves me feeling very alone as a spouse. It feels very isolating because you're trying to figure out how to navigate that space. And the person that you want to communicate with or you're trying to is unavailable for that communication. And so there's a barrier that sometimes comes up that creates further isolation. And this may, again, resonate with some listeners, is uh, you want to find help or support, right, for this, for you as the spouse in how do I deal with this? How do I communicate with this person? How do I navigate this life, you know, with somebody who does have PTSD? Uh, But there's also the sense of wanting to protect your spouse Mm -hmm. and your family's privacy. And that can become really difficult because it's like, you don't want to make it sound like this person is a monster because they're not. They do have a mental health diagnosis, but they're not a monster. It's just a part of who they are. And it makes it hard to find other people who share those similar experiences. So it can be frustrating and isolating. And it can feel like that your communication is just completely breaking down. And I personally also experience a lot of guilt, particularly if I say something that upsets him because I don't want to create this shame or anger spiral that can happen. Um, And uh, something that I don't talk much about, but I'll share, you know, now is that I'm afraid a lot, not of him, but of losing him because I worry about his suicidal thoughts about me saying something that gets taken out of context or interpreted incorrectly and it sends him into this spiral of this total self-loathing and so I end up in a lot of ways becoming uh moving into that mode of hypervigilance that he's in where I'm also in that where I'm constantly thinking about what I'm saying or how I'm saying it in my tone, or even what my nonverbals cues are saying to him, because I worry that he's going to take it a certain way, and it's either going to create anger, or self-hate, or frustration. And so it also can be incredibly stressful because of all of that. It's a, it's a difficult space to navigate, and figuring out how to approach your spouse. I will just say to touch on what I was saying earlier is maybe not what everybody wants to hear, but it is a highly personal thing because you know your spouse best. And so you will know a safer way to approach them that isn't going to be upsetting or frustrating um, for either of you. Yeah. Well, thank you for being so open and vulnerable about that because I think, again, that it's probably something a lot of people are, you know, is hitting them of having that same, some of those same fears. And, you know, so much of what you just shared is like resonating with me as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, yeah, there are, if he's, you know, elevated or triggered, whatever the word is you use for, you know, your family, Mm -hmm. like, I always say like that guy's emotions are the big, are the biggest, the most important. So I don't get to have emotions then. And that can if you're not doing whatever it is you need to do for yourself, um, that can lead to resentment, anger, you know, whatever, you know, it can lead to some bad stuff and it is unique what we're going through. And I know, you know, cause you're here, you're a leader here of that's why we create these communities is so that you're not trying to share or worrying about sharing with people Mm -hmm. who are going to be like, yeah, that, why are you, dealing with like why Mm -hmm. wouldn't you just leave like this Mm -hmm. sounds terrible this or or all this the terrible words of judgment of like he sounds crazy or whatever it might be and you're just like cool like I'm not getting the support that I need like I'm actually feeling judged and you Mm -hmm. know I am protective of my spouse because I do know what's going on and it's Mm -hmm. not 
what you're talking yeah it's not what you're bringing to this so thanks great I feel super good super supported you know um so yeah that's why I know you know that's why we have these communities that's why we have podcasts like this so that people listening can you know know oh gosh yeah I've had those same feelings but there are people out there also living this life who can relate to what I'm going through and be that listening ear or provide the, you know, share the wisdom you're sharing today. There's a lot of us out there in this life. And I appreciate you also saying that how individualized it is, right? Every person is different. Every relationship is different. So really exploring whatever it is you need to explore for yourself with your partner. Mm -hmm. I know you've talked a lot about a lot of this is like you, but it is coming into the relationship. So there are, are there any other ways that you really see that this has impacted your intimate partner relationship with your husband? There absolutely are. One of the main ways is that it obviously makes me much more aware of his emotions, his emotional state when I'm talking to him or when I'm trying to approach him about something. There are elements that are a struggle even now after the amount of time we've known each other which is for me thinking about things that might be triggering to him, trying to handle the quick to anger response, trying to maintain open communication in spite of all that, because as we all know, that's an important element of a healthy marriage is open communication. And it's created a lot of external stressors that we've had to learn how to work through with improving our communication and our understanding of each other. And there are still times that I feel like I'm walking on eggshells because I don't want to say something that's wrong that's going to make him more upset or something that's going to lead into this negative conversation space. I am a very blunt person. <laughs> and so uh, I still sometimes struggle with finding the right time to initiate conversations or the right tone. Sometimes I say things and I don't know how they sound. And then he'll say, well, I heard this. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant at all. <laughs> it's like, how did that turn into that? And sometimes it's just my tone where I, I'm not aware of how I've said something. One huge thing that I've learned in our relationship is nighttime is not the right time. It is not the time to bring up anything, talk, trying to have any heavy conversations, talking about combat, deployments, PTSD, anything, because all that does is put his brain into thinking about that then as he's trying to get to sleep and all that. And uh -huh. that's not, that is not a good thing. And so I've also learned in our relationship, a huge thing that I, I have basically self-taught myself with this is to ask before I ask him any questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Sounds kind of silly, but I always say, hey, I have a question about a time that you were in Afghanistan. Is it okay if I ask you that now? And he'll be honest and tell me either like, sure, go ahead, you know, or he'll say like, well, now's not really a great time. And there is a variety of reasons that it might not be a great time. And I'm also naturally a very curious person. So I have to kind of work on curbing my curiosity if he says now is not the great time to ask about that. And then another issue that definitely feeds into our relationship is um, that he can get very hyper fixated on things. And so he wants to solve things efficiently. He gets fixated on problem solving or troubleshooting things. And as uh, not to turn this into a gender thing, but as a woman, I tend to, uh, sometimes I just want to share something and it's because I want to vent or I want to share something, right? Maybe I'm frustrated by something at work and it's like, I just want to talk about what's frustrating me. But what he hears is this is a problem and I need to solve it. So then he starts presenting like 15 different solutions on how I could solve the problem. And to me, it's like, I don't really need that solution. I just need you to hear what I'm saying. And that can sometimes create some headbutting because to him, it's like, but I've laid out all these great solutions for you. <laughs> Why aren't you taking a solution? Yeah. Um, and so we've had to have discussions where we will say sometimes before a conversation, is this a, can you help me fix this? Or is this a, can you please listen to me <laughs> type of conversation? Um, and so things sometimes that are also in that same vein, things that are easy fixes to me 
uh, can become a huge focus for him. So we have um, a dog, well, we have two dogs and they create chaos in the house. And so to me, an easy solution is just put up a gate and block them out. But to him, it's like, I need to set up a gate, but I need to have it in a certain space where it's not going to create a hazard for anybody. And I need to have it so that the dogs can't get into accessing this point. But then if they get through this gate, I have to be able to block them from this next step. So that's what I was talking about with kind of thinking 15 steps ahead. And to me, it's like, well, let's just block them with a gate <laughs> and yeah. we'll go from there. And so it's it's something that I've learned to let him do to an extent um, because it is almost a comfort mechanism. But when I see it turning into an obsession and particularly with him, the things that become an obsession are things where where it relates to my comfort. So it's like, I want to find the perfect spot for this chair for you. So it's the most comfortable, you know, or you have this prime viewing of this certain thing, or I want to make sure that the bed is arranged in just this right way. So there isn't a draft blowing down you, which is very sweet and kind, but it also becomes again, then kind of a fixation point. And so I've learned that I need to ask him, what are the different things that are worrying you right now? What are the different things that you're thinking about? And then sometimes I will offer what to me might be an easy solution to the problem. And not necessarily say, hey, this is the easier way to do it, but to have say to him, about? yeah, exactly. Say, have you considered maybe doing this? And then another aspect of this with our relationship is he does have a tendency to want to control things because the PTSD can make him feel very out of control. He wants to try and control things that are around him. And that can be people, but it also can be the dogs it can be uh the way a space looks in terms of things and so when a situation to him feels out of control it really builds his frustration and stress over it and so for us to really try and work with that and to keep our relationship healthy and work with these different things that can kind of sneak in at different times uh, we try to have really honest conversations and do daily check-ins where he knows usually in the morning that I'll say like, how are you feeling? How's your mental health today? Like, is there anything you want me to know? Is there anything that is bothering you today? And to talk about what you were saying, creating a judgment free space mm -hmm. is huge for that. That's what I've tried to do for him is create a completely judgment free space where he can share anything that he feels the need to if he's saying you know I'm feeling depressed today you know that he knows that I'm not going to panic and run and you know call call the doctor or things like that um and I I understand that again it probably sounds easy to say that to say like oh we'll just create a judgment-free space and everything will be <laughs> everything will be great right I know that not every person has a capacity to hold space for the types of things that their partners might want to talk about or things like that. And that is where therapy or if they have a trusted friend or things like that can be helpful because in our relationship, like something that I've had to do also is acknowledge where my limitations are and my boundaries are because I can't hold space for everyone on everything all the time. And I've talked to him about that in a way that he knows it doesn't have to do with any judgment and that I'm still acknowledging how he's feeling. And I do want to touch on just quickly, because I know I've talked a lot about the way it impacts mm -hmm. our relationship, but in a positive way, because we do talk a lot about the negative aspects mm -hmm. of PTSD, but from a positive stance, it really has built better communication and connection between the two of us. So I've learned how to read him a lot better and understand him. Our relationship was originally really defined by kind of putting a, a wall up and pretending things were okay or kind of guarding thoughts and feelings. And um, we, you know, we have really become very open in our communication. We share everything with each other and talk about everything from feelings and thoughts we have to difficulties you know in our day and things like that and it's something that we have to work on daily 
to maintain open communication and to make sure that I am monitoring how he is feeling and how I'm approaching him. And we both had brought really unhealthy communication patterns uh, into our marriage together from our previous relationships. And so it took a lot of work uh, to get to the point where we are, where we've recreated these healthy patterns and learned how each of us has our own communication style and how to work together to build a stronger, better foundation. I really appreciate you bringing up the positives because that that resonated with me. I think when we're in it, we're really in it and all of this stuff that you're saying sounds really hard and really far away or, you know, for some people, it may even sound impossible. Know that like, Lauren, I feel like, but from what we talked about, like you've been there, I've been there. Like we've, we've been there where those, those things felt like not even not, not, maybe not possible, but not even like that. There's something that you could even think about, like as something Mm -hmm. that you can try or do, or, you know, that might help. And I totally agree that the positive of this, while it was nasty in the (laughs) middle, is that it forced learning how to do the hard work that really if we're getting if we're being honest that is required in any healthy relationship whether a mental health diagnosis or you know military veteran life is at play or not right it forces Mm -hmm. those conversations and it's kind of like uh are you gonna swim or sink you know like can can you figure this out can you do this because we need to we need to figure it out now because big things are happening and I totally agree I just I think back on my like younger self and I'm like I can't imagine even being as open and vulnerable I can't imagine that I'd ever be so comfortable being open and this open and vulnerable with a partner or that some of the things that we talk about so easily you know 10 years ago Hannah would have been like what like you know (laughs) no you do not talk about like that with your partner or that's that sounds so scary or and it doesn't mean that it isn't but you work at it and y'all have clearly worked at it and so for those listening who are saying yeah wow that sounds super great that you guys are in a great (laughs) place right they worked at it. We worked at it. It takes the hard work. And the that part is hard. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yes. It's, it's like I said, I don't want to paint that everything is rosy and perfect. It's not. It is hard work every day. In fact, we were just talking about that in the car this morning about how you have to work mm-hmm. at having a healthy relationship. You do every day, any relationship. And this one, it just, it just forces it and faster ways, different ways, more intimate ways, whatever, you know, it just, it just forces, but it brings about that positive, like that emotional intimacy, that connection, those really healthy communication strategies that you're talking about that, that help it be a lot easier. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I hope is what people are hearing. Like when you get to those points where you figured out those strategies in your relationship Mm -hmm. and where you need to come together and that you're both willing to come together in that way, it gets a lot easier. It doesn't mean it's easy every day, but it gets a lot easier. And I wish I had like a a magic book I could open and give everybody the strategies that will work for them. (laughs) But unfortunately, it really is individual because something that works for me and uh, approaching my husband may not work for you because your husband may have completely different triggers. He might have completely different experiences. He might have different emotions. He might have different under, I mean, they do have different experiences really yeah, to combat yeah. appointments like that. And so it's something where you really have to work on learning your spouse. Like you really have to learn them and learn what their experiences are, learn what their viewpoints are. And that is the best way to inform you on how to approach them about mm-hmm. things and how to support them. Yeah. And have them learn you, you know, and learn Mm -hmm. yourself. If you don't feel like you, you've done that work, doing that work is critical again in any relationship, but especially when these things are at play. 
I kind of, I kind of took it somewhere else, but I was just like, I was like, man, like Lauren's got it so together, you know, like, I, I, but I know that you guys worked at that. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to make sure you guys all know that takes work. So something we hear a lot, and I know you have some experience with too, is we're talking about PTSD and PTSD doesn't necessarily happen in isolation, right? When you are exposed to trauma, it's also very individualized how you react. PTSD is one thing that can happen. You've you've mentioned some depression and things like that, but there is a lot of comorbidity or you know addiction maybe at play. All sorts of things can happen. So I'm just curious what might have been unique about that for y'all. Yeah, I think when it comes to um, comorbidity, absolutely. My husband has anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, as we talked about, the suicidal ideations, moral injury related kind of issues tied into the PTSD. And there's a lot when you consider all that to balance there and try to understand. And I think that for me, part of working with him is understanding and knowing that there are other disorders present and that these things don't exist just in a vacuum helps me in better understanding him because these, that's part of what makes symptoms unique for each person is that one person might have PTSD and they might have depression alongside that. Someone else might just have post-traumatic stress disorders. Someone else might have anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's a whole mishmash of things that can come about as a result of combat related stress, deployment related stress, uh, military related stress, <laughs> uh, just in general. And so I think that remembering that as a spouse, remembering the different diagnoses, not defining them by them, but understanding if there are different diagnoses present is really important because it helps you better understand the different pieces that make up your spouse. And it's not all of who they are, but it is parts of who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes everything unfortunately a little bit more complicated to suss out piece, piece out what's what and what needs what to mm -hmm. improve it. It definitely can, you know, complicate treatment. And so it is important to explore all that stuff, educate yourself. You know, I think that's another big piece of what we're talking about is, is yeah. getting in whatever, whatever information you can get your hands on talking to experts and um, peers, like you mentioned, who are dealing with this thing, with this stuff, either from, you know, our partner's end of talking, they're talking to their peers to understand what might be going on, what might be an option. And then as the spouse, also talking to other people who are, are dealing with this can be so helpful just to inform. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things or words we hear when we're talking about PTSD is the word trigger. And that can be anything that uh, essentially triggers a response of some, uh, uh, some degree with our mm -hmm partners who may be dealing with PTSD. So that can be something that's really challenging as the spouse, the partner, the family member, whoever you may be, even some of what you've already talked about, if like almost kind of feeling a weight of responsibility of mm -hmm. like, this is my job to manage these or like, I don't want to do this and then feel guilty about it because it triggered them. So I'm just curious what, what your experience has been with triggers, what you've kind of learned, what you might have to, to say on that for, for us listening in. Sure. So as far as triggers, uh, yes, that is a huge, huge part of the post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis, a huge part of what we experience. And so for him, like as a, as a little personal anecdote here, as an example of kind of how we deal with triggers is so nighttime for him driving uh, creates a lot of anxiety. And I don't mind it personally. Like I don't mind driving at night, but he has uh, personal, you know, stories that tie into why he does not like driving at night. And so typically to manage that, which can be triggering for him, a lot of the time what I do is when I plan things that we're going to do as a family, I will try to plan things during the daytime so that we're not driving at night because sometimes he can even be uncomfortable even when I'm driving at night uh, just because it puts him kind of on a high alert. 
And so I usually try to do daytime things. So of course it's, it's winter right now. So unfortunately, uh, thanks to daylight savings time, yep. it gets dark really early. And sometimes we like to do things like, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, when it's the holiday season or things like that, we like to go look at lights mm -hmm. <laughs> or go, dark, yeah. go to events and things in the area that are holiday related. So and all that does not necessarily happen at like two in the afternoon. So with that, sometimes we will do things in the evening. And so I'm aware that that can be more difficult for him. And so the other night we were driving and it was dusk. So it wasn't fully dark yet. And three deer actually ran across the road right in front of our car. And I could tell he was just absolutely like in a state of like, panic and like his brain was just somewhere else in that moment so all I did was I put my hand over on his hand and I said I know that that what just happened was really scary is there anything I can do to help do you want me to drive like we can pull over and I will I will start driving and his he was I I mean like I said I could tell he was kind of still disoriented so he was just like no I'm I'm fine but when we got home he approached me and he like out of the blue and he said, I just want to really thank you for asking if there was anything you could do and for reacting that way. Because he said like, I, I didn't used to receive that type of compassion and someone who, you know, doesn't treat me like I'm crazy basically because mm -hmm. something, you know, bothers me or upsets me. Um, and so sometimes verbal reassurance is enough in our relationship and sometimes it's you know a physical like a quick touch or you know holding his hand or you know putting my hand on his leg or something like that to let him know that I'm there and so I think for us a way that we manage triggers is for certain things we try to avoid if we know it's something that is not something he enjoys so like he doesn't like crowds right so uh, when we were first dating, I had bought tickets to a concert because I thought it was going to be fun because it was an artist we both liked and everything. And I was all, I was all excited and I had done it as a surprise, mm -hmm. which learned to not do after that. But at the moment I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be so fun. We're going to go to a concert, everything. And so like a few days before I was like, so I hope you're, you know, free on Friday, like trying to be funny and everything, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, I hope you're free on Friday because I've got tickets too. And his face like just went almost white. Like he looked like he was trying to be like, oh, that's great. I'm so happy that we're going mm -hmm. to go to a concert. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't think he's happy. <laughs> and um it opened up though a conversation where I was like, okay, I said like, are you not feeling like you want to, you know, go to this? Is this something that you like, do you not like this artist? Like I thought you did or something. And he's like, no, I don't really like crowds in enclosed spaces. Like it makes me feel very uncomfortable. I feel like I'm constantly like just scanning and looking for threats and things like that. And so I learned based on that. And so I don't ever suggest things that uh, I know are uncomfortable for him and it's I, I understand also it's easy again to be like oh well you're you know your spouse doesn't like crowds like just don't go to anything crowded and it's like well okay but I also don't want to live my life like a shut-in right and and I understand that and it can be very frustrating as a spouse to feel like well I want to go do stuff you know or I want to go places and do things and so I think that finding things that you can do together where perhaps you don't push them outside their comfort zone, but you take them to the edge of it can be helpful. So if they don't like enclosed indoor spaces, maybe you suggest, you know, going to a park or something like that where there are people, but it's still outdoors and you start building comfort there. And particularly with triggers, I think that if you can build a relationship with your spouse you can be that support for them in that moment if they start feeling anxious or triggered. But it's important to also remember that like, it's not your responsibility as a spouse to keep them from being triggered because mm -hmm. like we yeah. said, it is their story. It is their diagnosis. It is their, their 
PTSD, you know, and like your job is not to create a wall around them because that's not healthy either. Um, to basically like them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so you can't always avoid a trigger and your job is not to actively like you don't have to turn into like hypervigilant mode and suddenly be like scanning everything to be like, all right, is this going to upset them? Is this going to, there are common sense things. I think like that if you know that your spouse is upset when they hear fireworks, if it puts them on alert, like don't say, Hey, let's go to the 4th of July show down the street. And then if they're like, well, that kind of makes me uncomfortable, then, you know, don't be like, oh, man, <laughs> like, I want, yeah. I want to go. You're no fun. You never get um, to do anything. I <laughs> and I think it can also be hard, I know, sometimes to open up conversations about triggers because they, even that word for some people can be seen as like a weakness or something negative. But I've found that when you're around your spouse, like the best advice I can give is, you get to know them the best. And so if you see like they start looking tense or they start to get, you know, stressed out or you're seeing something change in their demeanor based upon like a location or something that they've heard or seen or something like that, again, approaching with compassion and just saying like, are, are you okay? You know, or is, ev is everything okay right now? Like sometimes that's enough to get somebody to open up. And if they aren't willing to open up yet, then some of that, like I said, is their responsibility. And like, you shouldn't feel guilt or shame um, about that because it's not, it's not your job to help them overcome these triggers. Your job is to support them mm -hmm. through their own work is the best best way that I can put that it's the best way to put it and like if you as the spouse or a family member whoever you might be are trying then you're control trying to control the situation and no one can nor should try to control everything so you're constantly going to be stressed out letting you know feeling like you failed you know mm -hmm. because no one can do that so I, I really appreciate you saying that yeah this is it's not your job it's nobody's job it's it's your job to support them. It's their job to under, try and understand how they're feeling, what makes them feel that way, communicate with you, you know, like all that good stuff so that you can be a team about it. And as we're talking about triggers, you know, I think some people think of them as those very tangible things, right? You know, the crowd, the fireworks, the loud sounds, but it's also can be an emotion. And normally it is an emotion that something is triggering said emotion. Um, it can be stress. Um, mm -hmm. Like I know for my husband, most of those like typical things that you see don't really get him unless it's like real unexpected, like thought we were going to have an understanding of what this would be. And then something really weird happened. Um, but stress is a huge trigger for him and any type of stress. And then he just can't. Mm -hmm can't uh, deal so sometimes you can anticipate when like things are gonna happen like when we were moving buying a house having our baby you know like mm -hmm. I'm like okay so what are we gonna do about this to make sure like what are you gonna do about this to make sure you feel like you have what you need to manage what's going to be a stressful situation mm -hmm. um, what are we going to do about this as a team to make sure we're on the same page, we're communicating, we're putting those like practices into place. So much of what you've talked about and then other things you just, you can't, you can't mm -hmm. anticipate. So you just, you roll with it. Yeah. I mean, if you just, if you just show that you're there for support, like sounds obvious, right. But it's like, don't make fun of them. <laughs> don't like mock them when they're <laughs> like, if they're, having an upsetting moment you know it's like don't call them crazy like it's like if you show like I know this is difficult for you what can I do to help that reaching out for most people is one of the most important things that you can do it is and I know yeah we've talked about that the the don'ts and how both of our spouses have had you know bad experiences and interactions with it sounds like you said, obvious to say you shouldn't blame them for that. You shouldn't call them crazy. You shouldn't 
you know, throw a big fit about we don't get to do anything fun because of you and your PTSD, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Like in the moment, objectively, it sounds very, yeah, duh, of course, I would never, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I should never say that. But when you're upset, you're heightened, you're in the moment, um, that stuff comes out and it, it can cut deep mm -hmm. um, and create some deep lasting scars that everyone is going to think this way about me. So I can't really trust anyone to be supportive, to understand me, to care at all. Like my husband truly like believed that no one cared about his military experience. And I, I shouldn't say truly believed, like he had reasons to believe that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it took a long time for him to trust that I was genuinely supportive and interested and curious. Like you said, like wanted wanted to know, wanted to be there, wasn't going to judge him, wasn't going to, you know, call him crazy and say, you're the reason we, you know, are struggling. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of service members and veterans are unfortunately dealing with that, whether that be their intimate partner, other family or friends or people in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I know that a, um, a barrier for my husband, to touch on what you're saying also is um, that there was an aspect of also feeling like he didn't deserve treatment because it's like, he's the problem. It's all him. He's the soul, you know, creating this issue and this problem. And it's like, well, some of that is based upon reactions because uh, the way that he and I interact and the way he reacts to me is very different than in the past because the way he was being approached the things that he was being told the way that he was being talked to um were very overtly negative things and so he started thinking very negatively about himself and it's taken a lot of work to get him to a place where he does not think negatively of himself anymore and thinks like i am not a bad person i am not deserving of feeling this way and it's like that was a huge that was a huge barrier to his treatment for a long time yeah and and if you think about it it's like anyone who's getting that messaging from people they love or who are supposed to love them who are supposed to support them or even like this messaging comes from media and you know like mm -hmm. things like that of like you know the crazy vet you know mm -hmm. with ptsd doing this and that and that um, if any of us were subjected to that, it would have those deep cuts that are hard to come out of and, you know, unlearn those reactions. So mm -hmm. that's, that's huge. Um, all right. I feel like we talked a lot about the positives though. Mm -hmm. I, I, now that we're talking about the negatives, are there any other positives that you think have really come from this, whether that's for him or for y'all, for you? family I think the uh the biggest positive that I've seen is in that it's really taught both my husband and myself uh growth and appreciating each other and learning like how to build again that really strong basis of connection with one another and as far as our family, I think it's also, particularly for our kids, I think it's helped them learning some in terms of like emotional regulation and things like that, because they've learned in an age appropriate way, obviously, but like they've learned about, you know, their dad's diagnosis and about, you know, that sometimes daddy feels sad or sometimes he feels this and it, it teaches them not only being in touch with their emotions, but how do I regulate these in a healthy way? Um, and so I think that that's very positive because I think that's something that a lot of us struggle with, whether we have PTSD as a diagnosis or not, honestly. Oh my gosh. Yes. I think that'll be like, I think about that a lot with our daughter. I'm like, you know, we can talk, how are we going to talk about these things and, and how that can actually be such a positive for her, um, okay. seeing that and we're, you know, I knew I grew up and we were always like a happy family. Like everything was happy. We love to laugh. And I love my family. I'm very close to them, but we didn't always deal with the difficult stuff. You know, like they, they didn't necessarily know how to talk about that stuff. And so I grew up like not really knowing how to deal with like difficult emotions and had issues. And my brother had issues related to that. So being able to be forthcoming you know, with your 
children <laughs> about, yeah, not every day is perfect and we uh -huh. all have big emotions and this uh -huh. is how we deal with it as an individual. This is how we deal with it as a family. That can be such a strength, such a, such a positive that maybe other families aren't, aren't you know, I say force, but whatever, aren't having to have those conversations and therefore missing out, honestly. Right. I think we've talked some about, uh, we've talked a lot about strategies for, <laughs> for your relationship, what you guys do mm -hmm. as a couple, now some of what you've done as a family. I'm really interested to hear about things that you've put into place for yourself, you know, as we've talked about some of these these things that impact you as the individual and like, what are things that, you know, you're in fully could fully in control of with yourself that you've done that you found really helps you as you are managing this life with your family. Sure. I think for me, the two biggest things that I put into place are implementing um, self-care and then uh, space for self-reflection. Um, and so self-care I know it's like a super hot, like buzzword topic. Like <laughs> you hear about it everywhere, particularly in the wellness and mental health industry. And it can feel like something that um, you don't really have time for, especially if you are a caregiver or you're dealing with, you know, helping out, um, taking care of th things for your spouse when they do have PTSD or another type of diagnosis like TBI or something along those lines, or it can feel like a financial <laughs> burden for some people because we think of self-care and it's like, like, oh, I need to go have my spa day, you know, or I'm going to go, you know, and go shopping and do this, you know, or, or go on this, you know, five day retreat to Tulum or something. <laughs> and it's like, that all sounds great, but self-care. And this is actually something, um, give a little plug to the VSN for this. This is actually something I learned in my veteran spouse resiliency group that I thought was amazing. So if anybody's thinking of doing it, I highly recommend it, but it was what is self-care. And it was really re-examining what self-care means. And it, actually can be found in some of these quiet moments or found in taking literal care of yourself. So something as simple as getting up each day and drinking a glass of water to ensure you're hydrated. Brushing your teeth is literally taking care of yourself. It can be taking 15 minutes at night quietly to like read to and take some time to read a book. It doesn't have to be this highly indulgent thing or expensive or even time consuming. It's just finding time for yourself and recognizing that every spare moment of your day does not have to be spent giving everything of yourself to others. Because if you do that, you have absolutely no time to recharge and rest. And then you are no good for anything. You're not able to help really anyone. You can't help yourself, certainly. And you really can't help your spouse at that point or your kids if you have them. And then for self-reflection, I found that that's really important for me because it's given me space and time to think about how I react, like we were talking about, how I approach things, because it is incredibly easy, particularly with PTSD, to look at it and say, man, this is your problem and this is all on you. And like, you fix this, like, this is awful. I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> like, this is, this is not, not, it's not me. Right. Like I didn't, I didn't go to the war. I wasn't in the military. So it's like, it can't be my problem. But I think that if you take that time to reflect, you realize that it's something that can be influenced by the way you are reacting to a person or you are talking to them or you are approaching them. And so I think that taking time for myself each day is to really look at how do I want today to go and how do I want to approach things and how do I want to, you know, create a safe space? How do I want to create a safe and happy and happy? healthy home environment are really important things that I've had to learn because I, I used to really be that person who did not believe in self-care because to me, I thought it was something where it was indulgent and it was like taking time away from people who needed me. And it was really with the advent of the group that I started learning about like self-care is not this, you know, what we see on social media of like this, you know, hot topic where you have to 
go, you know, practice yoga for an hour <laughs> and now suddenly everything's better. <laughs> it's literally taking care of yourself. Nothing wrong with yoga, I'll say, <laughs> but <laughs> it's literally taking care of yourself, you know, and um, if you don't take care of yourself, you certainly can't take care of your spouse and you can't take care of your relationship. Absolutely. Here, here. And, you know, just like we've talked about everything with this is very individualized as is self-care, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, not hating on yoga because that might be somebody else's. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's what I need. That's how I care for myself. But it doesn't have to be how I care for myself. Uh, <laughs> and I think I love what you said too. the the self-reflection, like, if anyone's kind of struggling with that, like, I think that's probably the biggest thing you can do for yourself is carve out that, that time to just check mm -hmm. in with yourself. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about checking in as a couple, and that's probably one of the, the best things that you can do for your relationship health. So you need to be doing it for yourself as well, because in order to be there for other people, you need to know where you are. Um, mm -hmm. And it sounds so obvious. But when you're in the day, you're in the moment, it's so easy to just keep going and just push all those feelings and thoughts and things aside because they're getting in the way of what I got to do right now. But we do ourselves a disservice when we do that. And when we do ourselves a disservice, exactly like you said, we're we're doing those we care for a disservice as well. So I, I love it. And I'm so glad to hear that you learned it in the group. Uh, for those of you listening, mm -hmm. Lauren's getting ready to lead her first group. So if you're like, man, I just want to hang out with Lauren, you can. <laughs> um, lucky you. <laughs> but I know we, you know, if you're listening, Lauren and I have met, we have talked about this because there is so much. We could have dove into 5,000 more topics for 5,000 more hours. So I do want to just kind of leave us here in the sense of, of Lauren, is there anything else you feel like we, we talked about that we really wanted to touch on that we haven't yet, or that if there's anything that you just feel kind of this lasting piece of wisdom or, or whatever that you'd like to leave the listeners today? Uh, I think that the last thing I just want to say for my, my uh, piece of wisdom <laughs> from someone who's kind of been through the muck and is standing mostly on the other side at this point because our relationship has really grown and changed from where we were so um, there is hope <laughs> I just want to say that first of all and then my big piece of advice is to lead with compassion whenever you are trying to approach or talk to or engage with your spouse separate them from this diagnosis like they are not their ptsd it's mm -hmm. a part of them it's a part of their life and as a result of that it is going to be a part of your life but really looking at them as a whole person looking at their positive and you know their negative aspects because the truth is we are all complex beings, right? So we all have positive and negatives to our personalities, to who we are. Like we are flawed individuals. Nobody is perfect. And so trying to really separate out the person that you are with, that you chose to make a, whether it's marriage, a lasting relationship, partnership with, separating them out from that diagnosis is so important and doing it in a way that is compassionate. Always looking at them as a person, not distilling them down just to you are PTSD because they're not. And when you can approach them in a compassionate way and you both put in equal effort into the relationship, this diagnosis doesn't have to define your relationship. It doesn't have to define your life and it doesn't have to define theirs. It's only a piece of that person that you love. And i found for myself with my husband that there's so many other wonderful parts to him that it's important to not let those wonderful moments and pieces of that person be overshadowed by the PTSD that they're experiencing. That's, that's the perfect place to, to leave it. I, and you're right. I don't think we we talked about that, which I think so is so important, that separation, that ability to separate, and then also that empathy. Like, can you imagine having this? Like, they don't like this, you know? They don't 
they, I guarantee every single person would trade it if they could and get rid of it if they could. And I know that's something that helps me a lot when I'm feeling frustrated um, or yeah, frustrated is reminding myself that he's frustrated too. I mean, he's, Mm -hmm. he's frustrated and he feels like he probably can't really do anything about it. And that, that must be really challenging. And so when I'm able to step back and take that, I, I'm able to lead with empathy and compassion, like you're saying, and, and it, it's not always easy, but it's Mm -hmm. not easy for them. And that, that helps me so much reminding myself of that. So I love that leading with, leading with empathy and compassion, realizing it's a piece of them that they didn't, they have no control over the fact that they have it, that it is a piece of them. It's a part of your relationship that you both just try and figure out how to manage and you figure out how to manage it as a family. And we're, we all just do our best. We could talk for another four hours, but I thank you for joining us. I thank you for being so, so open about y'all's journey, your story. I know it's going to resonate with so many of our listeners. It resonated with me. And for those of y'all listening, if you're listening to this, like on the release date or near the release date, January is our PTSD and relationships month at the BSN. And so we have an educational um, seminar we're doing on this topic. We have a peer peer support uh, session we're doing at this topic, both towards the end of the month. So definitely come check us out. Lauren mentioned our Veterans Foster Resiliency Group program. We're starting a bunch of those up in January and February. We get into this stuff because, like I said, this is really one of the biggest things we hear from our participants that they're struggling with, that they're wanting support around. And so know that that's that's a huge part of what we're talking about in almost any group that you may interact with us around. So definitely come check us out, veteranswassnetwork.org org you guys know it we thank you lauren thank you everyone for listening and i know it's january so happy new year and i hope you all got something from listening to lauren today i know i sure did so thank you guys and we'll see you next month thank you thanks again for joining us on the veteran spouse network podcast brought to you in collaboration with coming home well We thank you for listening today and hope today's session left you feeling a little more connected or gave you some insight into the experiences of our military and veteran families. Don't forget to check us out at VeteranSpouseNetwork.org to learn more about how our military and veteran families can receive the support they deserve.